Hello, this is Craig from bitbox.co.uk. In this video, we are looking at the Path to Glory campaign supplement from Black Library. So, this was released in installments over the uh, Black Library advent calendar just before Christmas. And at the end of it, it was all um, released together in the Path to Glory supplement. So I'm going to go through page by page, as I tend to do. And you'll see all the different parts come together in the supplement. Some parts really good, as you have a whole, whole campaign. And there's a lot of good missions, a lot of good rules, which we'll look, we'll look through. And then there's the hobby parts, which I think are a bit a bit um, rubbish, really. They're, they're all right. Um, we'll have a look through, and you can decide for yourselves. So, Path to Glory, this is page one. Okay, so it goes straight into talking about Chaos Champions. So the whole um, idea of Path to Glory is that you have two to four players, all of which have a Chaos Warband, and they are led by their champion, who is um, a Chaos Lord. And the whole point of the campaign is to get your Lord um, into a Demon Prince, so you win favour points by doing certain stuff in the missions, which we'll look at later on. Um, a good example, if you head over to Mini Wargaming, they actually got a campaign up and running at the moment. Um, which is really cool. It looks like great fun, and it's definitely something um, we'll hope to be trying in the future. So this has a little bit about um, how you set up your campaign and your Chaos Lord. And then here it goes through everything. So I'll just go through the bullet points. So you pick a Chaos Patron first, so Corn, Zinch, Slanesh or Nurgle. And then you pick a Chaos Lord. Um, they do have restrictions, they may only be equipped with weapons, war gear or armour that are represented on the miniature. Now for me I like I like this to be standard in every game, but obviously that's not always possible. But um, it's pretty much oh, quite um, what you see is what you get with this campaign. And they may only be... Oh no, I just read that, I'm sorry, they must have a mark. Um, if they have, sorry, if they have a mark of chaos, it must correspond to their chosen patron, which goes without saying, you might as well take one. Um, there's no points limits or anything here, so you really want to kit out as much as you can get away with. They may take a single chaos artifact, but if they do, um, they start the campaign with one fewer unit of followers. Now in regards to the followers, um, we'll get to them in a minute. Um, they may also have D3 chaos rewards. If they take a familiar or steed, it must be represented on the miniature. So that's the beginning of a bit of a randomization. There's a lot of randomization in here, so and we'll be seeing a lot more of that. So you determine your champion's wall or trait. Now you get to pick a wall or trait, and you get to keep it throughout the whole of the campaign. Um, you can also randomize one as well if you wish. And then you can have to give them a name, and there's a name generate a thing which is quite cool, we'll get to that. Okay, so having named your cha champion, generate D3 plus 3 units or starting followers. Now I don't know if this is the same for both people, like whether you all have to roll a D3 each, or whether you just roll D3 plus 3 and that's how much everyone gets, it doesn't really explain that, this is sort of doing it in a way for each person, just sort of how it reads, so I guess each person would have to do this individually. Um, I don't really like that, I wouldn't want one person having six units and another person having four. That could just shift the balance too much to begin with. So um, if we played it, um, we'd probably just have everyone picking the same. Uh, I do apologise if it's not too clear on the screen when it's a bit bright. Oh, it's okay, so after you've generated D3 plus three units, um, you have to pick them from four different tables. Oh, three different tables, sorry. And um, there's a fourth one, but we'll get to that soon. And um, you can also sacrifice any number of these to get an additional favour point to start with. And um, it's probably not worth doing, because you really want to try and win the games to get more favour points. Okay, then after that, um, record all the information on your Warband roster sheet. And um, there's a link to download them. And yeah, they're quite cool. And then finally, devise a name for your warband. So a lot of creativity um, if you go into this campaign. So 
you know, you know you can generate a name for your war for your um, warlord as well as your warband, and you could even give names to all your units. So next we go on to the chaos champion name generator, and it's all done by D66. So we've got two pages of it. And quite interestingly, um, one of my chaos lords is named after a chaos lord from one of the old Citadel journals, who is Cyrak the Slaughterer, and that is actually an option on here if you were to roll 41, 56, and 51. Um, there's um, different titles for each god, so for example if you rolled 31 and 34, so you had more, more valed, then say for example you rolled a 40, 45 for his title, and you could have the Malefic for any patron, or you could have Lord of Brass for Corn, the Ascendant for Zinch, for Bloated for Nurgle, or Hellheart for Slanesh. Um, really cool, I'll definitely use this just to name characters for any campaign um, if they're Chaos, certainly, um, whether it be random or just picking syllables and titles. Um, really cool, really like that. Okay, so now we get on to the followers. So we, like I said, there's, there are four tables, but you only roll on three of them. So you have a retinue follower table. So the options are 10 Chaos Space Marines, 5 Warp Talons, 3 Mutilators, 5 Havocs, 5 Possessed, 20 Cultists, 10 Chaos Space Marines again, and 5 Chosen, 5 Terminators, again there's 5 Chosen, Blit Raiders, and 10 Chaos Space Marines are literally just running diagonally down here. There's also 3 bikes in there, um, Havocs as well, and uh, Hellbrute's also in there actually, it's quite interesting. Uh, as well as Plague Marines, Corn Berserkers, uh, Noise Marines, Fires and Suns. Um, they're all in squads of their chosen number as well, so 7 Plague Marines, 8 Corn Berserkers, 9 Fires and Suns, etc. And um, if you're Corn and you get Plague Marines, then it just simply tells you to swap them out for Corn Berserkers, which is here. Then you have a Hero Follower, so you could actually have a Chaos Spawn, a Warp Smith, a Dark Apostle, a Sorcerer. A Chaos Lord, yeah, another Chaos Lord that is, and then a Spiron Follower on the 6, um, you have to re-roll, but, but then that follower, what you re-roll of, will have a Gift of Chaos Mutation, which is quite cool. And then there's a Vehicle Follower Table, which is Predator, Helldrake, Vindicator, Forge Fiend or Wall of Fiend, a Land Raider and a Defiler. So you can build up quite a, excuse me, you can build up quite a good, um, <coughs> I'm losing my voice, you can build up quite a good little warband there, and if we go to this next bit we have an example warband. So um, Steven decides to start a warband dedicated to the blood god of Khorne, his chaos lord Cranalax for Thrice Damned, who is equipped with Terminator armor, chain fist, and of course bears of mark of Khorne. He rolls a d3 to see how many cash rewards he can have, but only rolls one, so he decides that an aura of dark glory suits the character of his blood soaked champion. Then he chooses a warlord trait, set them on the master of fence from a personal traits table in the Warhammer 40,000 rulebook. And he notes all the information on the champion box of his warband roster. Next, he seeks some followers, so he rolls a d3 and scores two, adding three to result for a total of five available units. Now, um, he hasn't randomly generated here, it doesn't say you have to, but some, um, I know on many Wargaming they've been randomly generating their, their followers, and um, the tables are there if you wish to do that. Which I quite like, I quite like the idea of doing it random, just adds a bit more fun to it. So he chooses eight Corn Berserkers, and he gives them a Rhino with dedicated transport. Now, um, if, yeah, if you get a unit and they are allowed a dedicated transport, you can get that for free. Um, not like there's points values, but you know, it comes as standard with the unit. So he also selects 10 space marines from the retinue and gives them what I got of Vengeance and the Mark of Corn. Okay, unsure of what to take next, he puts his decision in the hands of the gods, rolling on the retinue follower table. Our result 
of 64 nets him a trio of Chaos Bikers. And he gives them a mark of corn, of course. Stephen would like to like, paint a large centerpiece miniature for his force, so he rolls on a vehicle, follows table next, and is pleased with a result of two, which is a Helldrake. Then with one unit to go, he feels that he has enough to paint already, and besides he is eager for glory, he sacrifices his last unit for a favour point. Now this sort of works on the assumption that you ro he's rolling for his warband and then he's going to buy them and build them and paint them. Um, I think the, most of us will probably just work with what we've already got. But you know, if you want the motivation to buy and paint more miniatures then you could do that. And here is the um, warband given in the example. Okay, so now we go into the Path to Glory itself. So it goes on a little bit about favour points and rewards of battle. So basically, um, you, for every battle you play, you do get a favour point. However, if you win the battle, you get D3 favour points. And there's also other rules to get more. Once you get to around 10 favour points, then your Chaos Lord will turn into a Demon Prince. And if he then wins a game as a Demon Prince, you win the campaign. There's also a Rewards of Battle table, which is similar to sort of stripped down version of Chaos Boons. So a double one will turn your Chaos Lord into a Chaos Spawn. Um, and you roll on this Eye of Gods table at the end of each game for each person, whether you win or not. So three um, changes attacks to d6. Four gives him acidic blood, so if he's wounded in the assault phase, then each enemy model in base contact suffers a strength 5 AP3 hit, which is quite cool. 5 is it gives him fear. Uh, um, and then 6, 7, and 8 gives you um, lesser, greater, and exalted rewards, which we'll look at later. 9 gives him zealot. 10 gives him demonic armor, which lets him reroll um, failed armor saves, which is quite big. Um, 11 gives him the demon special rule. And then 12 turns him into a demon prince. So you could literally turn into a Demon Prince in your, after your first game and then win the next one and win the whole campaign. Um, that would make it a very short campaign, but you know, it's not always the most likely thing to happen. And these are also designed to be up to four players, so... So it could be even less unlikely for someone to win two games in a row and also get the Demon Prince special rule. So... These are the Exalted and... Um, greater and lesser rewards. There's one for each god. So we'll just quickly go through them. So the corn lesser reward lets you roll two dice for each denova which roll um, from every warp charge um, dice in your pool. So you essentially get double. Uh, great reward is rampage and the exalted reward adds um, two to your attack characteristics. For Nurgle, you get it will not die as the lesser. Greater gives you an extra wound and exalted. Um, makes enemy models half their weapon skill and blizzard skill while they're within 7 inches of your champion. And that um, rounds down as well, so it's quite nasty. Zinch, if you successfully make the Niver Rich roll against a psychic power that targets your champion or his units, you regain d3 wounds lost. For the Greater, um, you get the Deep Strike special rule. And um, that also applies to any unit you join if they're in reserve. And Exalted um, automatically gives you a Psycho Special Rule. And you roll D3 for his mastery level. And you get to generate your powers from the Zinch Discipline. For Slanish, um, your champion gets acute senses and night vision. For Greater, you can reroll failed charge rolls. And for Exalted, at initiative 10 step um, of the fight, say, well, for fight subphase, each enemy unit that is locked in combat with your champion must take an initiative, initiative test. If that's failed, then that unit's weapon skill is reduced to 1. So at the end of each mission, as well as rolling on that table and gaining your favour points, you can also add another unit to your um, warband, or you can upgrade units that you already have and there's a table to do that as well. So again, another table I'm going through, I'm afraid, but... 
So um, if you roll a 1, then once per battle you can re-roll any failed wound rolls um, for the rest of the turn. On a 2, um, once per battle you get shrouded for a turn. On 3, once per battle you can shoot twice in the shooting phase, um, once once per turn, and that can also be at different targets, which would be really handy if you're a shooting, a shooting army. At four, once per battle, um, you can basically instead of moving, you can just um, arrive somewhere else uh, via deep strike, so you sort of teleport. On a five, once per battle, you roll a dice for each model in, that, in the unit that's been slain. On a five or six, and um, that's brought back to life, so similar to the old reanimation for Necrons. And if you roll six, you get to roll twice on this this table, so you get two upgrades. It's also quite nice. So here's an example of a roster sheet, and there's a link to download them from Black Library. And they look, you know, look really nice. And if we're playing this campaign, I'd certainly, certainly use them. There's a more old artwork. So this just tells you about how to win the campaign, and as I explained earlier, it's all about just getting 10 favour points. You could shorten up or make it longer by changing the number of favour points needed, as it explains there. So now we go into the missions. So this first one's called Megalith. So, um, it's all about trying to, um, there's like a megalith and one army's trying to like boot, boot it up and the other one's trying to take it down. Um, I'm not going to go into all these missions in great detail as this video is getting long enough as it is. But essentially, um, um, if you've got a unit within three inches of a megalith, then you roll a dice and then you keep, you sort of keep a running total throughout the game and then once that total gets to 20, um, you can either cast down or raise a megalith, depending on if you're a defender or attacker. So, for example, the defender that has it in their deployment zone. So if they have a unit within 3 inches, they roll a dice, say they get a 6, then that's added to their tally, and the next turn they get 4, so that tally is now 10. And then um, the same for the other person. Now, I don't think it says about contestants, so I think you literally just have to have units within 3 inches, so you, on the same turn you could both be trying to raise it or trying to cast it down. Essentially whoever gets a 20 first um, will win. Or I'm guessing um, whoever, is at, whoever is at the highest by the end of the t game, if you run out of turn. So then there's rules as well about your favour points. So if a megalith is still standing at the end of the battle, the defender rolls a dice for each favour point they bid at the start of the battle. So, um, oh, I missed a bit there about bidding favour points. Okay, so the defender essentially picks, um, picks a random number, which they'll just keep on a dice or something. So if a megalith is standing at the end of a the battle, then, then they roll the same number of dice as that number they picked, so if say they picked four, they roll four dice. And on any four pluses they gain an additional favour point. However, if it's cast down, then they still roll the same dice, but on a one to a three they lose favour points. So that could be quite a big swing for the defender either way, regardless of the result of this one. So next one's Trial of Champions. I quite like this one. It's four players and you uh, Warlords start in the middle and the rest of your army start further back. So it's almost like an arena of death. So I'm just quick, quickly looking through the special rules. Um, any models fighting challenge can reroll hits. Um, you, reroll, you take away one victory point for each unit that was still in reserves at the end of the game, which probably usually going to be zero. Um, I was literally just slave a wall of the first blood. And you, it does say you can get extra 
victory points. So if you take down two warlords, you get um, two, vic two victory points. So it's literally just um, a victory point game. So out of war, rewards of chaos. Now this one's got different altars, which are basically objectives. There's one for each god. It's all about trying to um, hold them. And there's also um, special rules that you can get from them. So if a character or a warlord's within three inches of an altar at the start of their turn, they can call upon the power of that god. So they roll a dice, and then they get different rewards. Um, I won't go through them. Now, as I said, this video is already longer than I thought it would be. So next is Lair of the Beast. Now, I really like this one as well. Because um, you can use it for all sorts of different scenarios. So essentially, um, you're fighting on the demon world. It also says you could use it um, to represent a Tyranid world. And uh, that's what I did on Mini Wargaming. So, starting from a second game turn, each player must roll a dice at the start of their player turn to see if a monstrous creature is set up. On the 1 to 3, nothing happens. On a 4 or 5, they can set up one monstrous creature. Creature that they contribute to the pool. So you do have a pool of monstrous creatures to choose from. And on a 6, they can set up a monstrous creature. Included one that's provided by their opponent. Um, so yeah, it's essentially both players have to bring in some extra monstrous creatures to use. You don't, you know, you can have to, one person would have to load themselves. And then um, these monstrous creatures are just set up randomly, they're neutral from both armies. However, you do get additional victory points for killing them, but as soon as you target them with a shooting attack, they then are controlled by the opposing player. So it sort of swings and roundabouts, but it is worth trying to take them down, because it is a victory point game, so getting the extra victory points. It's quite good, and it's um, it's not just um an additional victory point. I think it's D three victory points. Let's, let's have a look. In addition, players score D three victory points each time one of their units complete, completely destroys a unit from a pool of beasts. So yeah, D three victory points for each beast you kill. So well worth going after. So they just represent like great demons turning up or demon princes turning up or if you're on a tyranid world it could be counterfexes and trigons so yeah. really cool certainly a mission i want to try regardless of whether it's going to be in a path to glory campaign or not so next up is demon worlds so these are all rules for fighting on demon worlds so essentially you've got the slaughter sphere which is the corn demon world or a corn demon world of course there's many of them so at the start of each game turn, you roll 2d6 and then you pick results of here. So I'll quickly go through these. So on a 2 to 3, um, each unit on the battlefield that contains any psychos suffers d6, strength 8, AP3 hits. Um, on a 4 to 5, uh, so my player is the second turn, each player picks one non vehicle unit in their opponent's army. That unit must either move 2d6 towards the nearest enemy unit or suffer d6, strength. Strength 8, AP3 hits. Oh, 6 to 8. Place a 5 inch blast marker over the centre of the battlefield and scatter at 66 inches. Um, anything that's under it or partially under it suffers Strength 8, AP1 with barrage and ignore cover. Um, then you roll a dice, so I want to roll a 1 to 2. Um, another blast. blast appears and you just keep going. Um, until a three or higher is rolled, so that could be devastating if you <laughs> roll in quite low numbers. So on a nine to ten, if a player's warlord has a mark of oh, sorry, each player rolls a dice and one to result of each unit in their army that's been completely destroyed. If a player's warlord has a mark of corn or is a demon of corn, add an, another additional one to result. The player who scores the highest immediately adds a unit of three d six blood letters to their force. Who arrive via deep strike. And 11 and 12 is returned to the slaughter. So if the player's warlord has mark of corn or demon of corn, again, had the one to result from a roll off. And the player who scores the highest can pick one unit that has been completely destroyed and return it to the battlefield via deep strike. 
So that could be a quite a fun one to play on. Um, I've looked through these before and some Demon Worlds are more exciting than others. I do really like the Corn one. However, I would pref I would recommend fighting on a neutral ground because they can really favour someone fighting on their own planet or do one of each. So one Corn player on a Corn planet and a Nurgle player on a Nurgle planet, etc. So in regards to a Nurgle, Nurgle um, planet, same thing again, just roll 2d6 at the beginning of a game turn. So um, basically on a 2 to 4, all terrain is dangerous terrain until the end of the next turn, and that, but that don't affect anything that can fly or hover, etc. 5 to 6, let's roll the dice for, for each unit that is within 1 inch, that is not entirely within 1 inch of a terrain feature, as long as again they're not a flyer, skimmer, etc, or they have a mark and ergle. If result is equal to or greater than the unit's armor save, it's up to D6, strength 7, AP4 hits with ignore cover and poison 4 plus. On a 7, I roll dice for each wounded model on the battlefield. On a roll of 1, 2, or 3, they suffer another wound with no armor saves allowed. However, if they're demon or they have a mark on Nurgle, um, they regenerate a, a lost wound. So on an 8 to 9, both players roll a dice. The player who rolled the highest can place a dice on the battlefield and scatter it 2 to 6 inches. Each unit within 7 inches of that dice um, suffers as many strength 7, 84 hits as the number of models within 7 inches of that dice. So that's quite a nasty one as well. But um, that will affect anything within 7 inches, so it could affect your own stuff. And then 10 to 12. And both players roll off with the winner selecting any unit on the battlefield, and then that unit is re immediately removed and then returned um, using Deep Strike. And um, then after that, you roll a dice, uh, and you add one to result if it's a demon of Nurgle or has a mark of Nurgle. On a 1, 2, 3, or 4, the unit suffers 7 strength, 7, 8, 4 hits, again with ignore cover and poison 4 plus. And on a 5, 6, or a 7, the unit is restored to its stat and strength. So, bonuses or um, nasty effects happening there. So, this is for um, the Zinch Demon World. Now, there's only three results on this one. So, you roll a d6 and on a two, three, uh, no, on a two, four, five, nothing happens. But on a one, the fire tide rises rapidly, engulfing all in its path, an agonizing flame before receding as swiftly as it arrived. So each unit on the battlefield that is not a flyer, swoop, and flying monstrous creature suffers D3 strength 9 AP3 hits with the ignore cover special rules. Units with a mark of Zinch or that are demons of Zinch only suffer a single hit. So that could cause a lot of carnage, but again, it's only on a one. So on a three, and you are scatter dice, and the tide of blue fire comes in from the edge of a battlefield that the arrow is pointing at. Any unit within 18 inches of that edge suffers D3 strength 9 AP3 hits with ignore cover special rule, and again, um, anything with um, markers inch or demons inch suffers a single hit. So, um, as you can see, the Zinch ones are quite deadly, which is why there's only three results. Okay, so on a six, you roll a dice for each non-vehicle unit on the battlefield that has suffered casualty. On a roll to five or six, return D3 models to that unit. And um, return D6 models if they have a mark of Zinch. Or a demon of Zinch. And then lastly we have the Demon World Lotus, which I assume is your Slanish one. At the start of each game turn, each player rolls a dice, whoever scores the highest can pick a non-vehicle unit in the enemy's army, then, then roll another dice. On a 4+, plus, the unit is overcome by a fragment of mist. Um, unless they have a mark of Slanish or Demon of Slanish, then it only affects them on a 6. When the unit is overcome by a mist, roll 2 dice and add its leadership to the result and then consult the table below. So on a 10 or less, the unit is overcome with a state of pure bliss. 
and remove a retire entire unit from a battlefield. Even if they are not slain by the enemy, it will take several hours for them to recover and be of any use. Wow. So on an 11 to 13, roll a dice for each model in the unit. On a 4 plus, they suffer d6 randomly allocated. Wounds with no armor or cover saves. Wow, that's a, that's a d6 for each model in the unit as well. Ouch. 14 to 16. Um, during this game turn, the unit cannot move, run, charge, or pile in. It cannot cast psychic powers or attempt to deny the witch. It cannot shoot or make attacks in the close combat phase. In short, it cannot do anything. However, it does have fearless and feel no pain 4. Plus. But I suppose that's still better than being removed entirely. Now, on a 17, plus, the player whose unit it is moves at 2d6 towards the nearest enemy unit. And if it brings it into. Um, Base contact, it counts as having charged. And um, that unit also has furious charge until the start of next turn. So essentially they don't get as bad as you roll higher. Okay, so now we go into a section which will probably be quite brief. These are the paint and guides. So a list of paints. And then very quick step by step. I'm not going to go into any detail here. Uh, you've probably all seen these painting guides before. What is interesting is for each um, cult, troop, Kormzaga, Plague Man, etc. The model is very old. Like, these are very old models, and they all have a really old model and not a current model in these painting guides. Which is quite interesting. I don't know why. But they do seem to have these old models, and they got discouraged. So we've got Nurgle, so essentially you just get one Nurgle Warband and then Plague Marine. I'm literally only flipping through because, you know, we've all seen painting guides and um, these tell you a few colours but they don't really go into any detail beyond that. And then Slanesh, a uh, really, really old Slanesh model there. Um, why they've not used um, um, newer models? I I really don't know, unless these are just really old recycled uh, painting guides, which, let's face it, they probably are. So we've got a terrain guide on Demon Worlds. Now, I was quite excited about this until I looked at it. Um, literally, it just has a little bit about painting your skulls a different colour on your Realm on Battleboard. Then we've got this converted Demon statue, which just has a couple of pieces added to it. That's how you had a painter, I know it does look quite nice, don't get me wrong. But I expect a lot more from that really. And I'm glad I didn't just buy that as an individual thing on the advent calendar. But I did buy the whole thing together, and I don't feel as bad because the campaign more than makes up for the terrible hobby section at the back. <laughs> so yeah, that that is um, Path to Glory. Um this video was a lot longer than I expected. There's so many tables to read from, so many random results, but that is chaos all over. Um, it just looks great fun. Um, it's definitely something I want to do in the future. It's just a case of having the models to do it. Like, you'd need so many models to run this campaign properly, especially if you're just rolling for random units, because you need you need to have all them units available. If you roll five warp towns and you haven't got them, you know. You just have to proxy them or something, but um, I do have a lot of chaos models, but even I don't think I've got enough to really pull this one off. But it's something I want to do. Um, if I can get a few people together who have chaos collections, then may certainly it's something we could do in the future. If not, I'll certainly be doing some of the missions from this book, as you know they just look great fun, and I always love trying different types of missions. That's what keeps the game fresh, in my opinion, and makes it a lot more interesting and more fun. So, you probably heard me babble on long enough. We're now coming up to 37 minutes. So, all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and please like and subscribe to our channel, and I will see you in the next video.